Imagine you're in a real life application. Most of what you try to do in the real life is to optimize for different things. You want to have the maximum amount of money in your bank account. You want to use the minimum cost of materials. You want to minimize the energy in your system. You want to minimize the heat in your system. Whatever it is, it's either a maximization problem or a minimization problem. So this is one of the reasons why everyone has to learn calculus in STEM disciplines because the need to optimize things is all over the place. So in this particular section of our calculus course, we're going to have a couple different examples where we figure out a method to use the tools we have already developed to apply them to different optimization problems. Now, in this first optimization problem we're going to look at, I'm going to talk about a box. It is a square bottom box, so the bottom is a perfect square, then it goes up some height, and it has no top, but it does have a bottom. Now, the first step of most optimization problems is to draw a picture. We want to put all the labels down for our variables and just have a very clear picture of what's going on. So let's draw a box. There we have my kind of terrible diagram. That's okay. If you need to have a clearer picture here, I'll let my helper show you how this box looks. Okay, James, let's teach our students some calculus. So first of all, what are we going to say? Let's call this the length. And we'll call this one down here the height. I know. Let's, what about, okay, let's spin around. Whoop. So in this case, I'm having a square box. And, and what I mean by this, by this square base, is that this bottom and this side, that, that is the same. That's what it means to be a square. So let's call that maybe L. I'll call this bottom length L. And there's actually lots of L's. There's an L there and there and there and there. Anywhere along the bottom is going to be an L. And also there, 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 up along the top. There's L's everywhere. But I'll just put the one down. And then I will also make the height of this. I will call that h. So I've got a length and I've got a height at all of these different places. All right, now I want to go and try to write down some equations that reflect this particular box. Now, the first equation that I'm going to write down that relates to this box is about the constraint. The constraint in this problem is that I only have 12,000 centimeters squared of material to work with. From that 12,000 centimeters squared of material, I have to make the base. I have to make the four different sides. So the total area here is going to be constrained by this 12,000 centimeters squared. So this is the formula that I get. I call it my constraining equation. And what makes sense of it is I have my area, my constraint, my 12,000. And then this is equal to L squared. What does L squared represent? That is the base of my particular box. It has an L here and then likewise an L there. So the area of that square on the bottom is an L squared. Then I also have this thing called 4LH. Why 4LH? Well, let me take, say, this panel right here. This panel has a length of L on the bottom and then a height of H. So this rectangle right there, it's going to have an area of L times H. But I got four of these sides. They're all identical. So it's four times L times H. That's my constraining equation. Now, the next equation I want to write down is what I call my optimizing equation. Because the thing I want to optimize, the thing I want to be as large as possible is my volume, is the blue. So we have a different formula for my optimizing equation. And here it is. It's the volume of L squared H. This is the volume of a box where both the base has the width and the length equal to the same thing, equal to L, and then a height H. So L squared H. Now. We know that when I want to go and optimize a particular function of one variable, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. But the problem is I can't just directly take the derivative of this volume and set it equal to zero because with respect to what? There's multiple different variables. There's an L here and an H here. If volume was a function of only one variable, then I could use our methodology we've seen before, take its derivative, set it equal to zero. So I want to take this volume which has two variables, and I want to write it in terms of only one variable. Well, how can I do that? My trick is this. I'm going to take the constraining equation, and I'm going to try to feed it into my optimizing equation. I'm trying to get rid of one of the variables. I'm going to try to get rid of, in particular, if I look at this, I can get rid of L or H. But H is by its side. It's only there once, and the L occurs at two different places. So to me, it makes sense. Let's make H equal to blah. And we'll take the h and put it into there. Then I will only have l's remaining. I'll show you how to do this. So first of all, let's take a constraining equation. Let's rewrite it. I've solved this for h. I brought the 1,200 over, rearranged. There's my formula for h. 
I will now take that H, I will put that down into the volume, and where there used to be an H, there's now this big messy thing. Okay, so I have this formula. Let's bring this one up. Okay, I've got that. It's looking pretty good, but I'm gonna clean it up a tad. So I'm gonna go and just sort of take the L squared here and the L, cancel that, just get one L, and then the L squared over L is one L times that L squared. That gives me my L cubed. So a little bit cleaner. All right, making progress because now I can differentiate. I can differentiate because it's only a function of one variable, L. So that's pretty good. So let's take the derivative of this. This is just a polynomial in L, we can do that. So its derivative is the derivative of volume with respect to length is, okay, 300, the L goes down to a one, L cubed goes to three L squared. And what I'm doing is I'm setting this equal to zero. I wanna find the critical number. I want to figure out where a candidate to be a max or a minimum is. All right, a relatively straightforward equation. This is just a quadratic. I can take the 3L squared, move it to the other side, take the 3,000, multiply it by four, divide it by three, square root, and what do I get? I get that L is 20 root 10 centimeters. By the way, because of the square, technically it's plus or minus 20 root 10 centimeters, but let's think about this physically. A length of a negative number to construct a box doesn't make any sense, so I'm just gonna take just the positive root. So this is my critical number, and this is the value of L where I am going to have a maximum. Or at least, am I completely confident about that? I mean, it's for sure a critical number, it's derivative of zero, but does it give a maximum? It might give a minimum. There's a couple things that I want to check. The first point to make is that the endpoints under consideration, that neither of them physically makes a box with volume. Like, I certainly can't have negative values of L. That doesn't make any sense. A negative length doesn't make sense. But if L is zero, then this is a box with no base at all. That has no volume. If L is infinity, so this is like an infinite plane on the bottom, that would force my height to be zero. So again, it would have no volume. So the, the endpoints don't make any sense. Now I can reason that because the maximum has to occur at either an endpoint or a critical number, and clearly there's spots where this has positive volume, we can make a box the positive number, the maximum has to occur at this critical number as it's not occurring at the endpoints. Another way I could reason through this is the first derivative test. So if I actually look at what this derivative is, if I make my L a bigger number, because of this minus sign here, my derivative becomes negative when L is bigger. If my L is smaller than this particular critical number, then I'm subtracting off less, and so I have a positive number. That's what happens to my function. It goes from increasing to decreasing. I have a maximum via the first derivative test. So all of this is to say that the critical number we computed really is indeed the maximum. Now, we've got this L value. This L is 20 root 10 centimeters. But what did I ask in the problem? I asked what dimensions give the maximum volume. So I've given the L, I also had to figure out the H. So let me bring up just that L here, and then I will in addition note that we had a formula for what the H was. The formula for our H was that it was just this thing that we had previously. It told me H in terms of L. So if I take that particular value of L and I plug that in for my H, then I have now a new value of H. It's 10 root 10 centimeters. Final point. Let's think about what this actually physically looks like. I tried to draw it poorly, but at least relatively accurately to what would be the maximum volume. You see how the length here is 20 root 10 and the height is 10 root 10? So the maximum volume of this open topped box has a height that is half as large as its length. Okay, so now let's just go and summarize the key steps of what we've done. Every optimization problem in truth is a little bit different from the other ones, but there's common patterns and common steps that it's worthwhile to take. The first one was just the drawing out of the picture, and I really like that. I like drawing a diagram. It really helps me understand a problem, even simple ones, when I don't have a diagram, they're confusing to me. But in addition to your diagram, you're also standardizing the variables. You put the labels on there, and that lets somebody else read your presentation and understand what the heck is the L and the H even referring to. So do that first. Second of all, 
You want to write down your big equations. There's one equation for the constraint and there's one equation for the optimizing equation, the thing that you want to have. In principle, by the way, you might have multiple different constraints and a whole bunch of different variables so that in the end of the day, when you plug things in, what you get when you substitute it into that optimizing equation is that you get one function and it's in one variable. And that's what you want. If you've got a function of one variable, then you can take its derivative. So that's step number four. We take a derivative that gives us the critical numbers. And you'll recall that a critical number is a candidate to be a maximum or a minimum. It's not necessarily a max, it's not necessarily a min, but it's a candidate. So then you can go and try to classify all those critical numbers and the endpoints. We want to try to find where is the global max, where is the global min. You might also be interested in a relative max or a relative min. It would depend on your application. But either way, use the first derivative test, the second derivative test, check the endpoints, whatever you need to do in order to be able to decide whether it's a maximum or a minimum. And the final point is kind of a little minor one. It seems really obvious. I'm going to call it answering the question. And the reason I put this here is that different versions of the problem will often ask different types of things. In this case, I asked for the dimensions. That meant I wanted both the L and the H. Sometimes the question might ask for just the L, or maybe it would ask, what volume do you get, not the dimensions of the box? So always make sure to carefully read the problem and answer the exact question that the problem asked.